All right, so why don't we get started here? It's uh, it's 7.30, um, and it is time now to call the, um, the regular monthly meeting of the National Railway Historical Society, Wisconsin chapter to order. And um, again, I'm Mike Uhas, I'm the, I'm the president of the chapter. Uh, very delighted that uh, all 60 or so of you are, 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 are in attendance tonight. We've got a good, uh, good presentation uh, waiting for us in the wings. Just wanted to give you a couple of update on a couple of um, other things um, going on in our world. We, uh, Keith, Keith Schmidt, are you there? Keith, could you uh, could you please unmute yourself, Keith Schmidt? Keith Schmidt, I'm here. Yeah, there you go. I just want to give a shout out to Keith Schmidt. Um, he's the editor of our chapter newsletter, Sparks and Cinders, and you know this is the the edition that we sent out to our subscribers. Um, Can't see it, Mike, because of their your background. Like a radiator grill of a Sula and SD40. <laughs> Sparks and Cinders. This is the um, the November issue, with a photo taken by William Beecher on our front cover in color, and on the back um, we have some color photos as well. So uh, I, again, I want to I want to point out um, Keith Schmidt, uh, our editor, who is just does a tireless job uh, in putting together Sparks and Cinders for you. 10 times a year. It's the, it's one of the key benefits that membership in the Wisconsin chapter NRHS gets you. And again, Keith, thank you again for doing um, Sparks and Cinders for us. You're welcome. I enjoy it. Good. And we'll, we'll hold you to that. Excellent. Um, <laughs> good, good. Uh, what else are we going to say here? We had our first informal slideshow uh, on October 20th that went quite well. We had about 60, 65 people uh, show up um, and uh, some great presentations. A few of them went a little bit longer than we would have hoped, but we're gonna get better on that. And um, uh, we're gonna do that informal slideshow again in December. We're gonna have a regular December membership meeting on the 4th of December where um, the program is a uh, clam chowder and lobster roll uh, presented by Larry Eastwood. He is the president, the longtime president of the Philadelphia chapter NRHS. Uh, I've maintained a membership in that for the last 30 some odd years. And uh, so that'll be a, that'll be a great, uh, a great program. Dave Nelson, you're actually, we can see you this time. What did you do wrong? I mean, what did you do right? I I uh, I must be living a blessed life, but enjoy it while you have it. <laughs> Indeed, great. Uh, so anyhow, that's uh, that's our membership meeting a month from now, the fourth of December. Larry Eastwood uh, with the uh, clam chowder and lobster roll, uh, which is a, um, a a panoply of uh, New England area rail scenes, um, many taken by him. Uh, and other individuals over the years. So that, that'll that be an interesting one in December. Then there's that um, informal slideshow on the 15th of December, uh, which is a Tuesday. Uh, and you can find information of that, uh, these things coming up, you'll see them in our in your sparks and cinders. And of course, uh, through the email um, as, we, as we go along. So today's presenter um, is uh, you know, a friend of mine I've known Eric for a couple of years now. Uh, Eric has a, a, a long background in, in railroading um, and, um, uh, and, and he's going he's gonna to give you all that information uh, about himself. I'm going to turn it over to you. If uh, anybody has questions uh, for Eric, he'd be delighted to answer them uh, at the uh, the end of the program. So with that said, I'm going to turn, turn the program over to uh, uh, Colonel Eric T. Hendrickson. Give a warm welcome to Eric Hendrickson, everybody. All right, so uh, I'm Eric Hendrickson, um, coming to you live from St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, I, I guess you guys had some nice weather up there today, but today it was rainy and, I don't know, 78 today, so. 
this is my presentation. Uh, you, this is something that I was actually going to uh, present to the train's 80th uh, anniversary uh, event. Of course, it got canceled because of the uh, of uh, the coronavirus. And uh, I've edited it down a little bit. There was some other stuff that I put in the trains version, but nonetheless, you guys are going to see uh, some stuff that nobody's seen before, uh, except for a select few. And uh, quite honestly, you're going to hear the story about how uh, I pulled off a miracle um, in in a couple different ways. And as I call it, um, so you're dumb enough to want a special locomotive, or how I learned to deal with rail fans and live with the bomb. Um, Woody Allen uh, mix there. Let's see here. So uh, I am a native of Wisconsin. My hometown's La Crosse. Um, I was born on the Milwaukee Road, uh, just down the street uh, at Camp 20, they call it, Camp 22, and uh, off of Avon Street. So I was, from the day I was born, I've, I've known the railroad. Of course, it was a CB and Q town, a GBW town at one time, and a Northwestern town. So. Um, I've got two boys, Jackson and Holden. Uh, Jackson is 13. He thinks he's 30 in his mind, but that's how teenagers are. I've got Holden. That's a three-year-old. Um, little spread there, but they're, they're, they're both uh, very dear to me, obviously. My wife, Heather, of course, is going to be sainted upon my death because she's put up a lot of my shit through the years. And uh, quite honestly, she's, she's the apple of my eye and everything that I've ever wanted. And... Um, I'm saying that a lot because her dad's on here too tonight. I'm trying to get in his will. So, um, and as a noted uh, benefit, I am a bona fide Kentucky Colonel. Colonel, I was given that last year at a, at an event, and uh, um, it's it's worked to my benefit. Quite honestly, <laughs> hard to believe a fat guy from Wisconsin would be a Kentucky Colonel. I am. Uh, this is my 26th year on the railroad. Uh, overall, it's been generally been good. Uh, there's been some tough times and bad times, but uh, overall, it's been great. The best part about all of it is the people I know and, and have met. A lot of them are on here, not just rail fans, but railroaders that are rail fans, but also like just lifelong dear friends from work um, that that are just like family to me. Uh, I hired on with the Sioux Line of Milwaukee, obviously post merger, and uh, we my. I started right at the depot downtown as a crew caller, um, got promoted right out of that right away as a, to a train dispatcher. And then they moved us to Minneapolis. Uh, so we went, I went up to Minneapolis for a while, became a chief dispatcher. And then uh, I took some jobs back and forth between Minneapolis and Calgary. So I lived up in Calgary on and off about a year and a half because they essentially took all of our jobs up there. Um, saw the writing on the wall that you kind of had to stay in Canada to be promoted. And I, I really, it wasn't for me. Uh, it was just a lot of different things transpiring at the time. I liked living there while I was there. It just wasn't for me at the time because I had a lot of, a lot of debt from college, just starting to get to know uh, my wife. And uh, well, I mean, I knew her, but you know, you know how it is starting a family and uh, it just wasn't right. So I jumped ship in 2001 and went to Amtrak as a train master in Chicago. Uh, within a couple of weeks, I realized that was a mistake, and uh, I jumped ship there in July of 2003 and went to CSX. And from there, I've done a whole host of different things, and uh, um, all of them have been very rewarding. Uh, uh, different parts of my career progression, um, some tough times, some some great times though. But the unifying thought of all of it though is that all the people that I've met along the way and become friends and or uh, co-workers with or or their supervisor whatever you want to call it um i've, I've it's been the people uh, i am former u.s army and you're going to see a little bit about that tonight um so that ties into our program about what what i came up with and dreamt up with um i was a combat engineer as i like to joke i was a i was a bullet catcher um essentially we cleared the lanes for the infantry to get through so i knew a lot of you know mines uh clearing minefields um uh, doing some pretty weird stuff although we were armored so um we had we had tanks but whatever um i am norwegian um i got it verified with 23 and me so i can prove it if you want got the question i am very hard-headed <laughs> and i freely admit i've been working on it for this is my 47th year on earth i've been working on it to try and 
chill it down a little bit, but I still get boneheaded and, and hardheaded at times. And as our chief operating officer, uh, Ed Harris said, he says, you do not give up. And uh, that's a direct quote from him. I'm like, I'm as bad as our beagle that we have. Uh, as soon as I get onto something, I'm not gonna let it go uh, until I get some kind of resolution on it, whether it be good or bad. And the one unifying theme that I like you guys to take away from all of this tonight is a phrase that I go by almost daily. And I got it from Jerry Kramer. And if, if you guys know me, I'm a huge Packers fan. Um, they won last night, which was great. I mean, granted, but it was a, a downtrodden 49ers team, but I don't care, it looked good. But Jerry Kramer said for years, you can if you will. And if you read his book, it's in there. And that's one of the models I go by because it really struck me that you can do anything you want. You just gotta do, have the will and be able to do it. And, and go after it. And, and that comes up along with my being stubborn. Oop, hang on a second here. I can't page down. Oh, there we go. There, there's your verification that I am an official Kentucky Colonel. Um, they do have my name spelled wrong and then eventually the, the, the governor sent me a corrected one and I got it framed in my office, but um, I will uh, accept, you know, different kinds of packets of KFC at times and stuff. So if you want to bribe me with any. These are uh, the locomotives we're going to talk about tonight. And then uh, I'm going to give you the, the story and the background behind them. But I'm also going to take you on a couple uh, special things that I pulled off through the years here. Uh, these are our pride and service locomotives, the first three. Um, you'll notice the police one on the left, the uh, veteran unit in the middle, and then our uh, fire truck version on the right. Um, and I'm going to walk you through everything. So how I got the idea. So this is actually stuff I've been unwittingly cooking up in my head for years. I finally got to a point after a while that I was just tired of being the railroad that, that rail fans love to hate. CSX um, is, as I say, we're just the same as every other railroad. We're just different paint. But for some reason, rail, rail fans uh, like to pick on CSX. I, and I enjoy being the underdog because uh, if you want to back me into a corner and, and see somebody come out fighting, that's me. That's my kind of guy. So I, but I, after a while, I just kind of got sick of being the, the railroad that rail fans love to hate. So one of the weird things about me is my Zen is I like to mow lawn. Uh, as weird as that is, that's my relaxation time. And luckily down here, I can mow it around a uh, year round. And one day I was out mowing the lawn, um, you know, it was 8 million degrees and 18,000% humidity, but I was out mowing it and I got thinking, you know, I really like those Norfolk Southern heritage engines. I like the, I like the UP ones. Uh, I really like the Rio Grande version of that one. And I like some of the other special locomotives that people have done through the years. And I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if I could just get this done and get something done? Because, you know, we're going through some transitions with the hedge fund taking over and uh, some new leadership. Uh, the, the infamous Hunter Harrison, who I, who I got to work for. Um, that's for a whole other presentation some other time. But uh, as, as they say, with luck, it, it's, it's opp opportunity plus preparation. So I had some opportunities coming in front of me and I have been unknowingly, I didn't know this, but in, I was preparing in my mind to do something for years. Um, in 2018, we, well, 2017, the hedge fund took over CSX and obviously we had some changes and some challenges and we started what was called a pride and service campaign in 2018. And our, our pride and service campaign is a, is a public outreach uh, program that CSX is the main sponsor, but we've teamed up with all of these uh, military first responders, children of first responders uh, to thank them for everything that they've done. Um, a lot of them never get thanked. Uh, you don't really think about the helicopter pilot that's, that's transporting a, you know, a trauma one uh, patient to a hospital. You always think about the EMS guy in the back. When the, and they're important too, but the pilots are important. Uh, the, obviously the veterans are important, the firemen. Uh, there's a whole host of different people that we, we celebrate in this pride and service. Well, I, I had been working directly for the chief operating officer, Ed Harris, and, and quite often I'd be talking to our CEO, uh, Jim Foote. And uh, great guys, uh, despite what you hear, I mean, they, they are businessmen, they can flip a switch if they have to, but 
at the end of the day, uh, you know, Ed Harris, for example, uh, has become a really good friend and, and he's very much, uh, he, he, despite what you hear, he cares about people. They really do. Um, and sometimes it doesn't translate well with, you know, sound bites or what you see or stuff in the field or what have you, but they do mean their best. Um, and what I've learned through my career is once you put stuff through a meat grinder called a headquarters, whether it be Army or if it be CSX or BNSF or whoever, stuff doesn't transition right and translate in. Uh, and when it translates out to the guy in the ballast line, it, it gets messed up. And that's one of our things that we've tried to work on through the years. So I wanted to, I was cooking up in my head to, to maybe pop this idea to these guys uh, one of these days when I could do it offhandedly. Um, but the number one thing was I had to be professional. Uh, you can't come off as a frothing foamer. Uh, and for the people that there's, a, by the way, that I've noticed there's some, some of my family that are on here, they may know what foamer is, but foamer is basically a slang word for a rail fan that foams at the mouth when they see a train, which I'm looking at that FEC train behind me and I'm kind of liking it. But, but you have to be professional when you deal with these guys. Uh, it, uh, it, it becomes one of those deals where like you cannot, it's, you have to have an idea, you have to have a plan, but you have to ha also have to be realistic with what you want to do. And, and you can't come into their office with, Oh my God, I, I, I we got SD forties. Let's repaint them and stuff. They're going to be like, what is an SD 40? And what are you talking about painting? And cause I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen with uh, historical societies or individuals that have approached our executives at events or whatever. And immediately they're shut down uh, mentally. The execs are shut down because they're just thinking, Oh boy, it's just, just, this is another wackadoo. Uh, so you have to be professional and sell it to them. So uh, through the years, uh, whether I was at CP, I had done a couple special things there. Um, some people that were on here may remember I got one of the, at the time, one of the brand new SD90s displayed in lacrosse for rail fair days, the 9303. It was one of the first big things I pulled off. Um, and and if through, the, through that time and a little bit of time at Amtrak and then festering at CSX, I had come up with these three different tenets of how to do something different when it comes to a locomotive. And, and I finally, this is the first time you'll see him in riding as, uh, cause I always had him up in my head, but these, these are what I go through. And this is how I had to sell everything to every executive that got in my way of this project because there was a ton of them. So the first tenant is the public. Will the normal Joe Schmo at a grade crossing, are they going to understand what this locomotive is about or a freight car or whatever that you're going to do that's special? Does it make spit? Does it make sense? Does it, does it come out and like, okay, well, you know, and it, I'm, I'm going to use Norfolk Southern as an example. So they've done the, the heritage locomotives and they've done Redding, they've done Penn Central, they've done a bunch of different ones. My favorite one is the Wabash, I think. I mean, it's close to a couple other ones, but when you talk to a congressman, and this has actually happened, when you talk to a congressman and you come out and they say, well, I thought the Redding Railroad went bankrupt. Why are, why are you guys painting riding locomotives? Like a congressman doesn't understand that because they don't know trains. Maybe Joe Biden does, but most of the other guys over there, guys and girls don't, don't get it. So you kind of blur your message. So you, so you have to have, does it make sense to the, you know, other people, specifically government affairs people, because as, as you'll see is that get, that gets tied into this project quite heavily. Now there's nothing against what NS did. I think it's terrific. I go out of my way to try and get them as a rail fan, but it's, they, they went a different route with their program. Ours, I could tell I was going to have to be custom tailored to what we wanted to do as a company. Will they look good? I mean, nothing against some of these other carriers that have done paint schemes, but some of them just don't look very hot. Um, and it's, as you'll learn, it's uh, a locomotive is not exactly like a, a Corvette to paint. Um, there's access doors, there's radiator grills, there's dynamic brake grills, there's a whole host of different things that you got to worry about. You got to make sure that paint scheme flows on that locomotive well. So uh, are the optics right? So that one is, you know, actually kind of came to light after we did some things. We did the 3194, which is the police unit. You know, are the optics right to take that, that locomotive into a time when people are, you know, a little bit upset over, over different things in society. Um, 
we thought it was, so we, we went ahead and did it. And, and we've actually had a better response with that locomotive than the other two, which was, was a pleasant surprise. Not to say that we haven't thought about it and not to say that we're hiding it because we're not, but it, you really got to think through what are the optics. You've got, you know, at one point during the pandemic, you know, some of the Western carriers had, well, and, and us included, we've had 5,000 people furloughed. All of a sudden you want to paint locomotives, which does cost extra, but yet you've got people on the street you know, that doesn't really look good and doesn't set well, especially with the troops, the ones that you're actually trying to get a, get across to your side. Uh, operational. Are they going to be used for normal use or are they going to be special use only? Um, Norfolk Southern, UP, they keep theirs in general service and then they'll yank them out as they need to for an event or what have you. Uh, we were kind of a mix of both. Uh, initially, we used them for general service and uh, we used them for, you know, obviously special events. But then I'll go through and uh, we had an incident with one of them that kind of scared some, some of the executives and they've since, you know, kind of just put kit gloves on. Uh, can they go everywhere? Like our, the three locomotives we got are heavy units. So they can't go like onto a branch line into, you know, the middle of West Virginia on some of these really bad tracks and bridges. So they have to be, you have to think through that. Do you want to have a four axle or a six axle that can go everywhere, or a six axle that can't go everywhere, but a four axle that can. So, because you got to think through it, like if a town or a city wants it for an event, you know, can we actually send the locomotive there? And is the track that it's going to park on, will it be able to handle it? That actually became an issue at the B&O Museum. Um, their track isn't, uh, you know, terrific, but we wound up doing some repairs and being able to get them in there. Are they going to be a pain to deal with? And this is a loaded question, but they can be at times. And it kind of ties together with the next question. Who's going to watch them? Well, it was me. <laughs> once, I, once the baby was born, these became Eric's locomotives to watch and manage and everything. I've since moved on to a different job, so I don't have to deal with them. But somebody has to watch them. Somebody kind of has to babysit them. And because they can get lost in the shuffle. I mean, you know, we, we have a ton of, we have thousands of freight cars and locomotives online any day. And if somebody watching these things, yeah, they're special, but they can get lost in the shuffle very quickly. So internally, one of the bigger things you have to sell is, can we leverage the goodwill? What is this special paint scheme gonna do for us? What, is it gonna get our name out there? Is it gonna help anybody else? What's it gonna do for us? You have to think through these things when, when you're talking to these executives. Uh, can we justify the cost? Uh, one of the things that I've learned is that the paint is actually pretty cheap uh, and the decals are fairly cheap. It's the shop time and the labor is what you're paying for. And the more complicated the paint scheme, the more expensive it gets very quickly. So these shop guys, you know, I mean, I'm not, you know, it's not fault. I mean, they, they all make over 50 bucks an hour and, you know, we paint 24 seven locomotives. So, there's generally, you know, 10 to 12 guys in a paint shop at a time at, you know, times that money. It can add up very quickly when you have something very complicated or, and or uh, significant that they have to deal with. And that's something you have to get, obviously, approved. Now, I am one of these kind of guys when I budget money. Once I was given the green light, I budgeted a certain amount of money. I actually shot over, overshot the number to, to make sure that I was going to be covering for all this stuff. And it come in, the number came in way, way lower than what I had shot for. And I became, you know, it's one of those deals. You owe, uh, under promise and over deliver. So the, the, that helped the cause with the executives. Um, can we justify the shop time? I mean, as you'll see with the 1776, that was a very long process to paint that locomotive. This event of these locomotives actually came at a time when we were between rebuilds of SD40s and Jeep40s at Huntington, West Virginia as our paint shop. We had just finished that program of those rebuilds and we were gonna do rebuilds of SD70s, but we hadn't got all the parts and the kits in to do the SD70s yet. So we had this natural weird uh, bubble that, that <laughs> again, there's a lot of, part of parts of this locomotive thing that just happened that I, don't, I can't explain. But we had this, all of a sudden, we had this point where the paint shop guys were going to get laid off, potentially, if they didn't have more work. So here, here comes Uncle Eric with these locomotives, and, we, and it, it filled a perfect void there. Any other time, it might have killed the project. 
um, are they going to blur our message? Our corporate communications people are, are very talented bunch. They, they, their whole goal is to drive into the public that we're a safe and we're efficient way of moving tra traffic and, and goods across America. And will a special locomotive, will that blur it? That comes in the kind of the government side of things where you maybe do something special and you know a congressman and you know gets confused by it. Um, and the most loaded question that I get from every executive right off the top was, are they gonna get us business? Uh, if we paint these locomotives, are they gonna get us boxcar one? Well, the simple answer to that is no, because uh, we have yet to prove it, but it does do, it does have many, many other benefits that can offset the cost. Number one being employee goodwill. Despite what you think, railroaders are just like when I was in the army. If they're not bitching, something's wrong. Uh, if they're bitching, you're okay. So goodwill a lot of times will keep guys going. And, and it, it at times can be very difficult to uh, get a railroader to think about things, but when they see something special, I, I, the best story I can tell you is we were, I was moving the two locomotives from Bayview in, in Baltimore. We were taking them up to the B&O Museum to roll out there. The engineer, former Conrail, just bitter, just angry, bitter. He had a little bit of that Baltimore thing to him. You know, they're a little bit salty anyway, but he was just angry and bitter. Hated CSX. They, they ruined his Conrail, this and that. But as the, we probably got 15 minutes into the trip that was about, you know, two hours long. And all of a sudden he started softening up because he's like, these locomotives are really cool. Awesome. We kept going, talking and talking. By the time we were done and had those locomotives parked at the, at the, the B&O Museum, he had me taking his photo in front of them for, to show his family and his wife. And that's the kind of stuff that you cannot you know, put together and add up for the bean counters to show that you've made a difference. That guy changed his attitude a little bit that day, just a little bit. And that's all I'm looking for is just a little bit. <clears throat> so... I, this is uh, the part that's very near and dear to me on, on both of these, or all three of these locomotives, is that I included a lot of my friends. Um, a few of them are on here tonight. Um, so Tyler Harden, some of you guys know, because uh, Trains Magazine did, a, did an article on, is a very dear friend. Uh, he's a rail fan, but he's a graphic artist. Um, he's a very close confidant, and he gets, he gets, he understands the lines and how a paint scheme should work. I mean, he's a graphic artist, but a rail fan, but he can put that together to understand how a paint scheme should work on a, on a locomotive. And then, of course, Bill and Marshall Beecher are on here. Bill's probably falling asleep already at this point, but <laughs> these, these guys are like the, the brothers from another mother for me. I've known them for years. The, uh, I mean, I'd take a bullet for them in a heartbeat. Um, well, maybe not Marshall, but Bill, I would. But, <laughs> but uh, they're my fertile ground for ideas. These guys are so freaking talented. You see them take photos, or you see them take a video, or you see them spin music, or you see them drive a car, or you see them deal with their family, and it just makes you feel like a lesser person because they're so freaking talented all the way around. And they are so fertile for ideas. They are so ingrained in the rail industry, not only as employees, but as rail fans that, that I can look at them and they're like sponges that I can get ideas. I ring that sponge and get ideas out of them. Um, we also have a little group chat that we brainstorm things at times with a, a bunch of us. And uh, that became a lot of the ideas of, of what I wanted to do and, and, and see. So, I had to have some idea of what I wanted to propose when I was gonna go talk to Harris. And I call these the Magnificent Seven. These were cooked up from ideas from, from the guys, uh, but Tyler, and we came up with some different ideas. Tyler mostly whittled down what we needed to look like or look at for in terms of locomotives. And you, except for a select few on here tonight, you're gonna to be the first group that's ever seen these ideas that we had. This was the first, uh, Idea number one for the military, as you can see, is very complicated. Um, almost from the get-go, this became a no because it's, it was just too complicated to paint. Uh, and, and I'll explain to that uh, later when, we get, when you start seeing some of the other photos. This was number two. This was uh, very close. This is probably number three in terms of uh, 
the uh, uh, order of what got picked. Uh, Mr. Foote really liked this one, but Mr. Harris did not. So this one got voted out. This was another version. This was just too much. And uh, I'm kind of a, I'm a little bit of a traditionalist. I guess there again, the, I'm, I'm boneheaded. I, I, I found it a little bit disrespectful towards the flag. So I didn't, didn't, uh, didn't like it. Telling my wife to get the dog because a beagle's starting to, to howl. <laughs> because uh, she wants to be up here on my lap, which is crazy. Notice it's a dog and not my wife. Uh, so <laughs> this was another version. This was probably number two of the selections uh, that almost happened. Uh, I really liked this one. Um, we had the yellow ribbon on here, uh, which was a little bit of an homage to how Conrail did theirs on that SD 50 years ago. Uh, but it kind of flowed good. Uh, and it was gonna, you know, it had the digital camo that everybody kind of wanted. This was another different version that we had. Um, the, a little bit simpler, the stars were gonna be a problem. And we're getting closer here. And um, you know, this was you know, another idea. If you notice uh, the swoosh um, coming down from the side, um, that was uh, Tyler's homage to my career on the Sioux line, the Sioux yeah, swoosh. So, I got this on my desk on December 19th, uh, 2018. This was the, uh, the selection that Mr. Foot and Harris made and he signed it, put it on my desk and he said, get me a hard estimate. And uh, you know, his, his initials and the date. And I kept this because I couldn't believe it. I mean, number one, I couldn't believe that they were giving me the green light. But number two, I, I, I wanted something to show that I had proof. So I've kept this and I'm getting, I'm getting it framed. Uh, for my dad. And this is the one that they selected. A little bit different than that other one, the last one I just showed you, essentially the, the stars are gone and we simplified it a little bit. And you'll see that eventually we had to change some other parts of it uh, because of how it fit on uh, the decals and whatnot fit on the locomotives. So this was our winner. So that being said, let's talk about secrets. Um, this was a very, very complicated process for me to get from idea to fruition, even to just get that approval for a hard estimate of what it was going to cost. And I knew it was going to cause a ruckus in the rail fan community. So I had to, to really uh, think through how I was going to deal with and who I was going to talk to in terms of, of this project as a whole. So it was very, very tough to sell internally. I mean, I cannot begin to tell you how many senior people said, I don't even want to deal with this. I don't want to hear about it. Uh, we were going through a lot of changes with the hedge fund, uh, with Mr. Harrison taking over. And, you know, people were concerned and not only the job, but also the, they were concerned with, uh, you know, having to deal with this on top of everything. So I had very heavy internal pushback. Going back to those three tenants, every one of those questions, I had to go through multiple times with multiple executives to get them to buy off. I had to get the, the head of mechanical to do it. I had to, get, had to get the head of marketing. I had to get the head of Corpcom. I had to get the head of customer billing, believe it or not, uh, because we were gonna change some stuff in terms of the locomotive numbers. Um, but rail fans, as I said at the beginning, became a big part of the problem. and I. I hate to call it a problem because it's excitement at the end of the day. And I had to figure out a way to harness that excitement. But what happens is we become a society of immediate, uh, you know, immediate um, gratification. I, I like to call it Paul Revere syndrome. They got to be the first ones to run out there that somebody's going to be doing something or that a train derailed or that, that, that somebody got fired or Hunter Harrison's taken over or CSX is going to do special, loco uh, special locomotives. It's, kind of falls back in our own society where we're kind of selfish and I'll be the first one to admit that I'm I've done that at times and I had to think back after it that I don't need to be the first one to tell everything I, I, I need to hold things in I harken back to Marshall and Bill those guys man you tell them a secret, you could give them the launch codes to the nukes they won't tell nobody and so I like to model myself after them um, Bill's a little itchy trigger finger but you know he'll, he'll generally keep them quiet for a bit <laughs> But everybody wants a race to publish a photo, you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, all that stuff. 
everybody's got to get that photo out there. Oh my God, CN, uh, like recently I've just seen it with CN going to do the, the heritage paint schemes and they're, they're putting these photos out there and then you don't know what to believe anymore. And I hate to say that, but like people doctor the photos. Uh, when I saw the first one, um, you know, I, I couldn't believe that it was real. I was like, I need verification. Of it. We had a little bit of an incident at the very beginning of this where something, some stuff was getting leaked out. Uh, it almost killed the project. I mean, it almost immediately killed the project because it went to the, the head of mechanical who's like, look, this is what I told you. I don't want to deal with this BS. So I'm done with it. I'm going to foot and Harris. I'm going to tell him I don't want to deal. I had to go out of my way to, to take all that pain away from that guy. And I wound up doing it by the grace of God. So this was the first one getting painted, the CSX 3112. Um, this became, CS, as you'll see in here, uh, the 3112 was in for some, um, it was going in for class one overhaul. So it was going to get paint. It was going to get fresh paint. When they gave me the green light to do the first one, the veterans locomotive, this was the locomotive I selected, the 3112. It was going to be the first one getting, you know, or fairly close to going to this paint booth. Uh, but they also let me renumber it. I had suggested to them like, hey, I'd like to renumber it the 1776. So in this, that's why you see in this photo, the number boards up on top are still 3112, which was the locomotive. We hadn't put the new ones in, but we had 1776 on the side. So this is kind of a transition photo. So this, uh, this was when the 1776 was getting its first base coat. We had, as you can see, we've done the black on the under, under frame and the, the primers on the, the car body. So this is when we were starting to do the digital camo. The, uh, the, one of the things I learned uh, with our paint shop guys who, number one, they're, every one of them are, are terrific. They're very talented. They're very terrific. And this paint scheme was all painted, hand painted on this locomotive. And I initially went into this thinking we were going to do a vinyl wrap. I come to find out after we did some, some study in, uh, Marshall helped a little bit with Metra. Uh, the vinyl wrap only lasts about a year. So, because the locomotives have all these cab doors for getting access to the prime movers and generators, uh, the vinyl wrap starts to peel off the corners. And, you know, within a year, it starts looking really badly. Uh, so, our paint shop guys are adamant. They did not want to use vinyl wrap. They wanted to paint it. And I'm like, guys, are you sure? So, this digital camo is seven different layers, and every, every area is different. So what the guys did is they made a, uh, it was roughly like a three foot by four foot template of each layer and they would move it around the locomotive as best they could and then hand mask off each one of these squares and then paint as needed as they get to layers. There's a little bit up close uh, when they were doing some of the other different, the, the grays and the greens. One of the things that our Huntington is our only major paint shop. We have a backup one at Waycross we use a little bit but Huntington's our major one. One of the cool things about Huntington is they have access to everything. They have this very, very cool laser printer that they can, they could take your photo right now. I could take it off one of these, these, this Zoom call, take a screenshot, send them to them. And in a, within an hour, they could have it on a, on a eight foot by 10 foot poster that we could peel and stick on some billboard on I-95. It's amazing. And it can do all these fancy different things. Uh, one of which is you'll see with the windows what we did. This was the, the rear end of the 1776, some stuff, some of the decals being cut. Here was after more of the different grays and greens were added. And you could see with the, the, the grills, like the, uh, the dy dynamic brake grills and the inverter grills and then the radiator grills, you have to go around all of that. That's what makes being able to do a paint scheme on a locomotive so difficult. This was um, towards the end of the rollout. Uh, this is like the, they were, we were doing, this is what our shakedown area is where we have a test track and then a shakedown shop. And uh, I, we knew we had to put the 3M scotch like uh, frame stripes on by FRA rules. But I told the guys like, let's do something special. And they came up with this idea of putting the American flag and a star on these stickers. And this is one of the shop guys applying them the, the, right before we released them for regular, regular service. And uh, here's a little hint that a lot of people don't know about. This is one of the, you're the first group that'll get told this. 
in that 1776, hidden around in the, the digital camo around the locomotive, are all eight of the senior executives for CSX hidden in their names. This is Ed Harris. You can't see it with the normal eye. I have to kind of point it out to people where it is. This was my attempt at, uh, attempt at saving my job and sucking up to them, quite honestly. And because, you know, you kind of got to feed their ego a little bit. They're not, not saying that they're egotistical, but, but you got to kind of give them a little shout out because they're the ones that gave me permission to do this. And it was my way of saying thank you. And this was their fingerprint on this project. And I, I really appreciated everything that they did to let me do this. Because this, for me, was a dream come true. So here's something that uh, a lot of people don't know. When we first rolled out the 1776 on the rear radiator here, we had the five branches of the military. Um, I had written the Department of Defense, uh, proposed to them what I wanted to do, sent them some mock-ups, and they sent back this really nice letter saying, okay, go, go ahead. I don't think the person that sent it back understood what I was talking about. Because within about two weeks of this thing being released to road service, we had a, an attorney from the Department of Defense sending us a letter saying, remove those decals. Well, we come to find out it's against the law to have a Department of Defense uh, decal on any company that's a for-profit company, especially one that deals with the military. Obviously, we do. We ship military movements. So I had to remove them. This was the day I went up to Waycross, Georgia, put on my gear and there they are after I took them off, uh, getting ready to go in the dumpster. So we had to come up with an idea pretty quickly because we were gonna start rolling this locomotive out to a lot of different events. And again, the Huntington guys are on the game. They came up with an idea with uh, Tyler and uh, uh, a couple of the, the different the guys that, that work in the shop there. And they sent it to me and, and I had to put it on. So that's yours truly up at, uh, actually at 75th Street in Chicago, uh, putting this decal on, which, by the way, it's not easy, but I got it on there and it worked out. And I learned, again, I learned from Marshall how to put decals on, uh, on locomotives specifically, actually. So I do get my hands dirty. I'm not just a prima donna. I may look beautiful, but I do get dirty. Um, so this was our fire truck uh, version, the uh, CSX 911. And uh, I don't know, you guys can't see these? Anyway, it's not working. Can you see this? Oh, there it is. Sorry. So I come to find out, and I'm, I'm a Sioux line nut. I like Sioux line red, but I didn't know that there's 18 million different shades of red. So our paint company, David Frost, that we buy our paint from, sent me a color palette, and you know we had to pick out the red, and I'm like, oh my lord, I, what color red? Well, it dawned on me one day. There's a Jacksonville Fire Department. Uh, fire building right down the street. So I walked down there with this color palette, talked my way in there, and I said, hey, look, guys, this is what I'm doing. Can I match a color to your fire truck? And it doesn't really show it in the upper left photo when I matched it, but the red that I put on the 911 is a spot-on match for a Jack City of Jacksonville fire truck. And eventually, we're going to have them hopefully all together so you can see it together. Um, one of the funniest things, and I don't know if Bill or Marsha had heard it when we were up there at the paint shop, but the paint shop guys do not like chevrons, and they hate pilot stripes. <laughs> um, however, uh, I, I was told that some of the senior executives really liked it, so therefore they were going to be on the locomotive, whether these guys like painting them or not. But that's an actual quote, and you could see, like, painting those stripes on a plow, it looks really sharp and straight there. Uh, in, in the photo, that is extremely difficult because that surface of that plow is curved so that when you get debris, it, it's, you know, it kicks it out of the right of way. But it, to get those lines straight and then also on the rear of the, the locomotive to get it over the, the MU cables and what have you, it's, it's a difficult proposition to do. This is when the fire uh, locomotive was in. At this point, it was kind of comical for, for me watching social media because the buzz was out that we were doing something and people kind of had an idea about the 1776, but they had no idea about the 911. And we pretty much got to the finish line without anybody leaking anything about the 911 until the day we rolled it out. Because for the, pretty much from the word go, it stayed in the paint shop. We kept them both in as best we could, but the 911 definitely stayed in. 
this was as they were applying the red. Uh, one of the things I wanted to get, but I didn't have time to get, was when we painted each one of these locomotives, we had GoPros uh, up on all four corners of the shop, and we did time lapses of these locomotives being painted. Um, I've seen them, they're pretty cool. I just couldn't get them in time for this presentation. Because um, it, it, it's, it, it's amazing how quick these guys work. I mean, obviously they're painters, professional painters, and they do this for a living but they're, they're very fast, despite uh, what you think. I mean, they do that masking, they're just so damn good. Uh, it would take me probably an hour just to, to mask off those windshields. Those guys do it probably like in 10 minutes. <clears throat> this was after some of the striping got on. Um, you can see he's doing the white down there towards the back of the locomotive. And here's some of the decals being put on by the shop guys. These are very generic. This is another comical thing to me. The, the police badge, the fire badge, and the EMS badge that's on the CSX 911 is, is a very, very generic version that comes off of, I think it's in, in Adobe or somewhere. And it's one that's avail available to the public. I learned, again, the hard way, that if you use the actual badges, they're copyrighted and trademarked. So you gotta pay royalty fees and I, again, it's just part of the process to learn. Uh, this is the horn off of the CSX 911. Um, I must have skipped the one on the 1776, but there's two different, there's special horns on each locomotive. The 1776 has a horn that came off of a US Army locomotive that served in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Uh, I wanted that horn because it's an S5, which is my favorite horn. But I wanted, it became very cool that it was tied into a U.S. Army locomotive. So I traded one of my own personal horns for that horn to put on the 1776. The Florida Northern Railroad had it. They had bought this Jeep from the Army, and it had this horn. I come to find out that this horn was, like, really valuable because it was an original GM&O horn from, like, the late 60s or something. And there was a couple of collectors that were trying to hunt it down and find it. Uh, one of the guys, Brent Lee, who's, who's a really close friend, a good friend, had been trying to track this horn down for years and then finally figured out that I had it and thinking it's in my collection. Uh, and I had to kind of tell him, like, it's, yeah, it's mine technically, but it's not anymore because I'm doing it for this project. Then he, he's like, okay, I get it. It's perfect being on that locomotive. This horn on the 911 is the only, it's an S5T again, another, another nice sounding horn. This, kind, this came off the one lone SD40 that the Gainesville Midland had, uh, the number 52 or some weird number, but it, sounded, it sounds fantastic. Here's some of the little things that you would see if you got up in the cab of the locomotive. Like the shop guys just took it to 11 on a lot of things. Like they took off all the numbering on inside, the number plating inside the locomotive and made these special, you know, flag versions uh, on both of them. They did all these little small, little neat things that you would have to really pay attention to. Like, like on the 1776 back on the generator and the, the switch walls, they've got all these little stars and stripes over there. It's, it's really, really cool. And again, this is rollout day. Um, this is, uh, we were putting the stripes. This actually, this was Bill's recommendation to put these, this stripe on the nose or on the, on the, you know, the, the anti uh, climbing um, uh, uh, plate there on the frame. And it, it, it's perfect. It, fits, it's, it, it looks perfect in photos. Uh, the 1776 you see back there, you see the flag on the, on the window. That's another special thing that I'll show you here in a little bit and explain some of the stuff behind that. This was our police version uh, that we came out with. Again, um, this is, you know, this photo got mixed up here, but this is when the police version was getting uh, 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 you know, the base coat of everything. This is before the, the, you know, a lot of the decals and or the gloss coat was put on. But here's a good shot of, of the windows. So remember, I was telling you about that laser printer at, at Huntington, it can do anything. So, you know, like, you know, Bubba has his truck and on the back of his truck window, he's got that, you know, maybe a deer or, you know, uh, you know, God bless America on his window. And it's got the little small little holes you can see out, but you can't see in. Well, this laser printer can cut those. 
and we wanted to do something for the windows. So I had to go and talk to the FRA and get permission to do this, which uh, after we, you know, prove it, you know, proof of concept to them, they were like all aboard. What we did is we, uh, Tyler, and <laughs> there's another little secret a lot of people don't know. All three of them had these on the windows. All three of those are taking fr taken from U.S. postage stamps that he manipulated to fit in a window area. And then we had them laser cut in there. So you can see out plain as day. It's not no issue at all, but you can't see in. And the train crews love this. The ones that have been on, they just can't get over that. You could see again, there's, there's a good example of the pilot striping, especially the rear end of, of the 3194 there, how difficult that could be through all those MU cables and the air hoses and whatnot. So I sympathize with the guys, but you know, hey, this, the senior guys liked it, so therefore it's gonna stay. Um, the, one, the photo on the left is rollout day for the 3194, and you'll notice the ditch lights, one is blue and one is red. That was kind of a last minute thing uh, that the, the shop guys helped out with. Uh, and this is again, uh, at this point when we were doing the 3194, well, let me step back a little bit. <clears throat> when I did the first two, when we were starting the 1776 and the 911, I kind of had to sell myself to the shop guys. Uh, like, okay, here comes Eric from Jacksonville. Here's here to help. That's the famous line. He's a H headquarters guy. He's going to go mess up something or he's going to cut jobs. Well, I'm not about that. <clears throat> so I kind of had to prove myself to these guys that, I was here to not only help them, but then have their back whenever they ran into issues, which I had done it, you know, through that. So when the 30, 3194 came around, I, I could walk around that shop, you know, you know, and have any confidence that if I asked for something, they would help me, or if they asked for something, I would help them. It was fantastic. So the guys went to the local theater, or so the story was relayed to me, and they thought it would be cool if the ditch lights, because our ditch lights uh, uh, wigwag or oscillate when they hit the, when you hit the bell or the horn when you come up to a grade crossing by law. So they went to a local theater and got these light gels and put those over the light because those lights are very very hot. <clears throat> they're by design they're hot because they're a they're bright but then also when you have snow and and ice that it melts it right away. Uh, and they put these on there for the rollout only when we were going to do the videos. And it, it's fantastic. One of the things about police cars, if you've ever noticed, they have a number on top of the police car. So like if you have aerial, if, if you have a, a bear in the air, as they'd say, you know, chasing a, a cop car, they can see the squad car number and know which officers in that vehicle. So we took a 211 and we put that number on the 3194. This is rollout day. Um, and this particular thing was really cool. This is, I walked in that morning you know, we were going to have, we were going to make, we were making it about the employees. It wasn't about me. It was a little bit about the locomotives, but it was about the employees that were veterans that were working in Huntington, West Virginia. And I walk in that morning and this paint shop guys are like, hey, we got something special to show you. And I come around the corner and they had made this sign and you, you probably can't see it really well on the camel, but they, they welded that aluminum rack together and they made this four by eight sheet of aluminum painted it with the same camel paint and everything, put the five logos, and on there in the names in white are every employee that Huntington that was a former uh, military uh, or, you know, a, a Coast Guard, any type of military, they are on there. And so one of the things that we did later in the day is each employee got their photo taken, pointing at their name in that board, and then along with the locomotive. And then that employee down the road, I got them all enlargements and sent them to them. It's that little bit of thing that you do for these guys that meant the world to them. I mean, there was guys, I mean, literally, there was a couple guys in there that got tears in their eyes because of that little, somebody acknowledged that they were important. And we have thousands of employees, and at times we can be cold and heartless, but it's important to me personally that every guy is important, every guy and girl is important, and that you recognize that they're, they're welcomed and that they should be thanked for what they do for the company. Because a lot of these guys went above and beyond. So I made these guys pose in front of the 1776 after we shoved it out of the paint shop, and then I made them salute, which amazingly they did right away as soon as I said it, <clears throat> and there they are. <coughs> these are all uh, paint shop guys that were veterans um, that had worked on some of the project. And a lot of them, uh, like three or four of them had stayed from third shift to uh, over into day shift to, to be here for this event, which was, again, 
you don't normally get that. 